Hello, I'm Richard Penson, and on behalf of the CME Outfitters, I'd like to welcome you and thank you for joining us for today's podcast entitled The When and How of Maintenance Therapy in Endometrial Cancer. Today's program is supported by a joint educational grant from AstraZeneca Pharmaceuticals and Merck and Company Incorporated. Um, I am Richard Penson, a physician at Mass General Brigham and Associate Professor at Harvard Medical School. I'm also the IRB chair at the Dana Farber Harvard Cancer Center in Boston. And I would very much like to welcome my colleague, uh, Ignace Fergota, the professor of gynecological oncology from the University of Leuven in Belgium. Welcome, Ignace. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and to discuss this topic with you. Exciting times. And you are um, uh, one of the um, great orchestrators of um, evidence-based advanced in this field. And um, actually, I was listening to a podcast with Mansa Mirza, and he cited you as one of his most important mentors. So accolades all around, and thank you for all that you've contributed. I'm going to give a brief introduction to maintenance therapy, <clears throat> and then we're going to look uh, specifically at endometrial cancer. So the history of maintenance therapy is, is interesting. So um, for a long time, we were distracted with bigger is better. And in childhood leukemias, uh, longer gave a better chance of cure. And so uh, we really didn't take that on board till Jonathan Lederman um, um, really uh, in an inspired move um, uh, changed from um, a lap rib is no better than doxel to study 19 and maintenance therapy was sort of recaptured as an important strategy and uh, the rustin data for a long time had contracted us to least to toxic therapy for the least time with our palliative goals but times have changed and so uh, especially in endometrial cancer um, it, it is a new season which is very exciting so um Ignis, when it comes to selecting patients with advanced and recurrent endometrial cancer for maintenance checkpoint inhibitor therapy, with all of the US approvals that have taken off uh, right now, um, just uh, give us your perspective on all of these options. Well, the, the first thing I would like to say is that uh, maintenance therapy in advanced and recurrent endometrial cancer is important, but it should be different for, for different patient groups according to the molecular characteristics. And I don't think there is one drug or one type of drugs that fits them all. So I think this is the most important one. We have, of course, the DMMR, where IOs probably are the most important. We have hormonal therapy in, in the most specific molecular profile. We have for the P53, Zenexor. We have HER2 and so on and so on. So probably we can discuss that later, but for me, one of the main messages of, of uh, this moment is that we have been defend defending molecular classification for the past 10 years. Also in the ESMO ESGO guidelines, we promoted very hardly, also in the adjuvant setting, that we should take molecular classification into account. But this holds even more true for um, the advanced and recurrent setting where we have clear data that the molecular profiling, and then I'm not only talking about the pole and the, the NMR P53, but also new uh, targets really can make a difference for our patients. So the, the, the tension between um, sort of lumping and splitting, if you, um, when you're in clinic sitting with a patient, how much on your mind is overall survival as the definitive metric. I mean, I one of the, one of the many things that has transformed my thinking of um, the checkpoint inhibitors is that with 40% crossover in Ruby, there is still an overall survival advantage, which is just amazing. So when you're talking, looking at a patient with endometrial cancer, have you dismissed the sort of lumping and the big outcomes in clinical trials? It is is molecular subclassification everything when you look at your patient? Of course, overall survival is the most important. But you should not only look to overall survival, but also to progression-free survival and very important quality of life. So if you can extend the PFS and the and uh, uh, add better quality of life to it, 
then I don't think OS uh, should be proven. But of course, ideally, also in ovarian cancer and other cancers, but also in endometrial cancer, if you have, if you can prove an OS as a primary endpoint, statistically significant, is of course the proof of the pudding. But uh, it's only in rare cases that you are able to prove that. Right. It is staggering in the year of targeted therapies in lung cancer, PFS. Um, and so rarely we see an overall survival advantage. Yep, we do, but not always. And especially, as you say, as we hone down on these subsets with smaller and smaller groups of patients in them, it becomes impossible to demonstrate overall survival advantage. Tell us a little bit of the history behind Selenexor in the P53 wild type patients. My, one of my kids, actually, now a medical student, worked with uh, Jim Kuzak on using this drug as a radiation sensitizer a very long time ago. How did you get into that story and how did you see the potential uh, to exploit it as um, a maintenance therapy? Well, as a matter of fact, maybe you don't know that, but Silinexa was developed at my university and then later sold to Cariofar. So just to give you a little bit of background, <laughs> all 15, 17 years ago. Outside of trading, good job. Outside of trading, it was developed, yes. Um, and it's clear that if you have a drug that can uh, prevent that uh, tumor suppressor proteins are exported, you might have a, a good drug. That was a philosophy. And then I was uh, contacting Carrier Farm and trying to investigate this drug, which was at that time mainly in hematological disease tested. Uh, I could convince them to test them in the science study, which was a phase one, phase two study, to uh, look at Selenexor uh, and gynecological cancer. And we had more than 100 patients treated um, with uh, ovarian, endometrial, and, and cervical cancer. And we saw some responses between 10 and 20% according to disease. But what was most striking to me at that time that we, those patients who responded, responded very well. That's why then the Siendo study was started with, as a matter of fact, as an academic trial uh, with uh, my university as sponsor and the BGOG as sponsor. Um, but doing a randomized study, phase three study as an academic group is difficult. So once the trial was running well, but not fast enough, uh, it made a change to what we call an NCOP model C or an um, um, industry sponsored trial. And you know, the results of Philinexor, the intention to treat was just negative. It was P06 or something like that. But uh, we looked, of course, what happened according to the molecular profiling, because we knew, we knew that if P53 was mutant, that um, giving Selenexa could not work. So that's why we looked, and that was also planned, to the P53 wild type. And then we saw, certainly with longer follow-up, we have now almost 40 months follow-up, and we just published it in Gynecologic Oncology with Vicky Merkel as first author. Um, that the P53 wild type patients and who are PMMR, that the um, PFS was almost 40 months, 39 months versus four and a half months in the control arm. So that was the basis why we are now doing the export EC042 study or got EN20, we call it in Europe. Um, where we do the same trial as in the Siendo trial, comparing maintenance in the next or after response on chemotherapy in the first line, advanced or recurrent disease, we compare placebo versus the next or, but only in the P53 wild type patients, where, which is a population where we expect that it's the only possibility to get a clean positive signal. And like I said, the long-term PFS data are very encouraging. And um, also the preliminary OS data are very encouraging and have been presented already, but they are not mature. But we hope, like you said, for OS, of course, also with maintenance, at least in the next one, but that remains to be grown, but in a specific population. Right. And Vicky Macca presented that 
data at ASCO 2024 as a oral presentation and with a big splash. So that is very exciting. When you when you are thinking strategically about how to advance the field, um, how do you divide your time up looking at sort of promising basic science advances as opposed to it's sort of just thinking how how are we going to mix these things together to best help patients in in the future how do you how is do you have a worked out philosophy or or you have sort of perfect intuition how do how do you approach it um maybe we'll come back to that if you talk about new drugs and adcs but i always think that uh, in today we should have a target and a good hypothesis before we embark on big phase three trials. Mm -hmm. um, it's also what you did with the next we we and also other drugs. We we try to find a hypothesis and then go further and try to prove whether it works or not. Um big like in in ovarian cancer five phase three trials with IO and high grade series of ovarian cancer. Without any good rational to do that, this is something which, uh, even though I'm also the PI of, of one of these five, this is something which I always um, have uh, had problems with. And so also with the automatic in the cervical cancer, I always have tried to find a target which is highly present in this tumor when we talk about ADCs, and then a very active uh, uh, payload to try to find the good drug for the good population. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, I hear you. I think that following the science is just a really good way to do things. It's not hope, it's desperation sometimes in, in other settings. So um, would you re just review your perspective on the um, uh, checkpoint inhibitor um, uh, treatment and maintenance study in um, endometrial cancer, the, the four big trials now that have um, shown advantage and have led to approvals, at least in the US? Um, I think there are five. <laughs> oh, um, my apologies. Yes, we have the Ruby trial, we have the ATTEN trial, we have NMG GYO18, and also the MITO END3, which was recently published yeah. in oncology, which I really not. And of course, also the duo e trial, which also has an arm with only IO, uh, the, the run up alone, the second arm. I think they all show very clearly that in the DMMR, the deficient MMR patients, um, IO is the drug that they should get and should get as soon as possible. And maybe another discussion point, I would say as soon as possible, but also as long as possible. Um, we, but we can come back to that. I think they all show very clearly and significantly that in the DMMR patients, chemotherapy plus IO is better than um, than the chemotherapy alone in the first line, recurrent to all advanced individual cancer. The big problem is one, the PMMR, the proficient ones. And two, what to do with PARPs? That's the two big questions to me. And PARPs in addition to IOs. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah. it, sorry, go on. As you want. Uh, I wanted to continue on the on the proficient ones, proficient MMR. Um, I think all but one are negative when you compare the PFS. And the proficient MMRs, uh, the attempt, the, the Ruby one, the METO trial, and the DOE trial, they are all, all negative refresh ratio between 0.9 and 1.1 for IO in addition to chemotherapy. We only have the energy O18, which is really positive. Um, clearly, I think. Uh, you could say pembrolizumab is better than the other three drugs or four drugs. Um, even though I believe pembrolizumab is probably the best one uh, as IO based on all the approvals I have had. 
I have hard to believe that one trial is so positive that we have a ratio about, uh, I think it was over 54. Um, and uh, all the other trials being negative. So I am not a believer that we absolutely need to give based on one of the five trials to add IO to chemotherapy in first line recurrent uh, endometrial cancer. Mm. Based on that. And then the second question, which I wanted to um, discuss with you is what with the um, PARPs. We have the duo E and we have the Ruby part two. Problem with Ruby part two, it's comparing dosarimab plus Neraprid versus nothing. So it's difficult to say that it's better. Um, and we don't know whether in PMMR, the effect of the combination is based on the addition of Neraprid or of or of Tostanumab. DOE, we have luckily a third arm, an arm with um, only the Ralimab, um, and the arm with the Ralimab and the Rapid, of course. And there you see clearly that the effect, like I said already, of the Ralimab is mainly driven by the DMMR patients, while in the PMMR, like I said already, it's negative. But when you add or up, you add something in addition. The question is, does that mean that all patients with PMMR need um, PARP plus IO? I don't think so. Why? No. Because, because if you look on the analysis with my good friend, Mansur Mirza, showed in ESMO last year in the uh, part one study of Ruby, it was clear that in the and as in P patients, the more specific ones, um, that for PMMR, probably the effect is driven by the P53 mutant patients and not by the P53 wild-type patients. Unfortunately, I don't have seen yet the data for the molecular classification for DOE and for energy GY or 18. But we have another study which was also presented at um, ESMO last year. It's a randomized phase two trial from the French group, Itula, where they did not give IO, but after response in first line, they added elaborate or not in maintenance. And they did not see a difference globally in the phase two. But again, what they saw is if, they're, if the patient was P53 mutant, you saw an effect of, of PARP. In addition, they did also an HLD testing. If they were P53 mutant and had HLD, the curves even split more. But that was an exploratory analysis. But it's hypothesis generating for me that PARP, in addition to IO, is probably needed in the P53 mutant patients. And if you have an HLD testing, if they are HLD deficient, molecular recombination deficient, then I believe probably the addition of PARP to IO makes sense. Mm. But for a um, patient with PMMR, who is P53 wild type endometroid, I don't see any reason to give PARP, but also not IO. No. Again, a mixture of the experience in clinical trials and the evidence from the uh, bench to bedside sort of understanding. Do you? How much do you think um, what we're seeing is an artifact of GY018 being so much a bigger trial. I, I'm not sure it's an artifact, but if you're doing five trials, that one is positive. Yeah. If for the DMMR, it's clear all five are positive, so there yeah. is no doubt at no all. Doubt. all. And it, and the it's logical. That's what we expect. But the PMMR, um, I think the findings are, are correct, but I would not say for me with the four other trials that this is enough, like I said, to give all patients PMMR IO. Yeah. So the um, you commented about um, treat them, I think you said for a long time or something like that. So um, no specifics, but um, how do you think about 
dose, three weekly, six weekly? Um, how do you think about duration of treatment? Maybe start with the division mismatch repair, the DMMR. Um, well, if if it's tested in six weeks, which several drugs have done, I think, of course, in a maintenance setting, um, IO every six weeks is uh, is preferred, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Again, for for the patient, it's certainly better to come to the doctor every six weeks instead of every three weeks. And in addition, I believe that IOs are a good maintenance therapy because the side effects are there, but they are usually reversible and are limited when you compare it with chemotherapy or or combinations of TKAs or, or ADCs. I, I think once you're over the start and uh, you know how to treat through the thyroid changes, uh, level changes, and, and this type of things, I think, like bevacizumab, these are drugs that are well tolerated and can be used to maintenance them in my, my mind. Yeah. If it's tolerated so well, why would you stop? Well, Merck always say you have to stop after two years because we don't have data for longer. But if, um, if I have a patient with DMMR who's responded to chemotherapy and IO, and I'm after two years, and, I, and the patient or the insurance can afford to continue, I would certainly continue. So, so um, checkpoint inhibitor for life? It's the same question with PARP. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a very different sort of concern in PARP. Yeah. Um, okay. If you think you have cured the patient, if you are convinced you have, you have cured the patient, you can stop. Yeah, I think probably the PARP, uh, you know, reducing it to two years max has really <laughs> influenced me. But I do a PET CT scan at two years, uh, biopsy anything that's of any concern. And if it's histologically um you know a pathologic complete remission i do stop at two years um occasionally there's a quirky thing we um i have a patient with a recurrent choriocarcinoma that has uh, uh the patient went abroad stopped uh their pembrolizumab and the disease came back that's pembro for life and then i talked to mike seckle who said oh yeah probably six months will be enough so, so there's just not enough data all too often not data, not data but if you have data <laughs> yeah. in front of you and she has a complete response. It's tolerating it very well. Yeah. I, I think I've had so much experience with uh, looking, sort of beaming love into the eyes of patients who, as they wrestle with a sort of sense of abandon, stopping maintenance therapy that and talking them into just doing two years or less uh, with PARP inhibitors, I think I'm sort of now equipped to, to support people through that. Let's move up to upfront. Um, some very exciting with up um, data with upfront studies with the goal not of overall survival so you live the longest possible but truly um, improving the cure rates the outcomes for curative intention tell us a little bit about checkpoint inhibitors in that setting uh, you're referring to first of all the leap one study i think yeah um, yeah um well in general i think we all have accepted that this is a negative trial. Um, but the, I said from the start, in my opinion, the bar is very high to compete with Pacotexar Cargo in first line in the metrum movement and Vatimid. Uh, and Pendolizumab is very difficult. And that's also what you see um, that uh, overall the ITT is, is, is the same. Um, but a little bit, patients who have received adjuvant chemotherapy or the adjuvant chemotherapy seem to do better with uh, up than vatinib, which is logical. Mm. Problem, if I may, um, um, is that they included patients with a gap of six months, yeah, which is short, which is logical to me to say I, normally, I would not retweet again the fact that some kind of that in, uh, yeah. again, six months. So I, I would love to see the data with patients who have had at least one year or one and a half year in between, and then compare it. Then I would 
be even more convinced that if a patient has had adjuvant smectex on carbo, and um, it's for instance one year or one and a half year in between, that you immediately have to go to an adult in the temporal, or we can go to um, the combination of chemotherapy with or without one or other maintenance therapy, which we have available now. Okay. Do, you, do you have clinical experience of salvaging patients with DMMR tumors uh, and progression on a checkpoint inhibitor by using lenvatinib or a different antiandrogenic? During not well, maybe you know that I did the and published the first lenvatinib only trial with 135 patients with lenvatinib alone. So we treated a lot of them with lenvatinib alone and we didn't cure them. And I felt that at that time we used the 24 milligram dose, so the high dose that was a really toxic um, drug. So luckily now it's 20 milligrams. And it's a good combination. So in second line, it's one of my preferred treatments to use. Then in first line, and that was the question, what do I think about LEAP1? Well, I think um, in general, I would say, unless the patient is recurring very fast after the adjuvant or adjuvant chemotherapy, uh, I would prefer to use Macatexel Carbo uh, in most patients in first line, not in second line, when you just have received uh, chemotherapy and then, then, then progressive, and there is no discussion of the best regimen in the second line if they didn't get IO already. Of course, that is probably uh, more and more the standard, especially in the MMR, uh, as we discussed before. Yeah. So um, I completely agree. I want to make a, a sort of highlight what you said about the six month platinum free interval. I do think, I mean, in my mind, I think that the taxanes are at least as good as platinum in the um, in endometrial cancer as a generalization. And so to extrapolate too quickly from ovarian cancer is a bit risky. So yeah. in the last bit of the discussion, I would love to get your thoughts about the exciting data from the antibody drug conjugates, and especially with their relatively narrow therapeutic index, but are just a great way to deliver a, a toxic payload. Um, how are you particularly thinking about those integrating into maintenance strategies? Well, um, we have a, a, a whole group of ADCs which we are exploring. And uh, of course, um, we have the anti her 2 which to me is probably the most promising. Um, we have the pandestiny results, again, presented by Vicky Mecker, I think, uh, at ASCO 2024, with response rates of 57% in second line. If the patient is her 2 2 plus or 3 plus, if it's a three plus, it was even, I think it was 85%. Yeah. So this, again, we have to do the phase three and NCOT and EOG are doing that trial and comparing it. But um, Tastizumab DXD, Deluxtican, uh, is certainly one of the possibilities we need to um, set as one of the most exciting combination uh, or ADCs in the cancer. Mm, it is uh, very exciting. Unfortunately, it's time to wrap up our discussion. Uh, so to briefly summarize, um, we have hit a new era where it is the standard to um, give concurrent uh, chemotherapy and uh, um, a checkpoint inhibitor with maintenance checkpoint inhibitor to all of our patients with deficient mismatch pair tumors. And then as Ignis reminded us, the challenge to really get the best outcomes for the other groups of patients um, is excitingly set for potentially the addition of PARP inhibitors, the integration of antibody drug conjugates, um, creative things like uh, Selenuxor and the, the new generations of drugs that are coming. So very exciting. To receive CME CE credit for today's program, uh, please complete the post-test evaluation and you'll be able to download and print your certificate immediately upon completion. 
Remember, this is a part of a six-point podcast series on gynecologic cancers. Next month, I'll be hosting a discussion about the expanding options for immune checkpoint inhibitors in frontline, advanced and recurrent endometrial cancer, and I hope you will be able to join us. We'll be archiving this and future podcasts in this series on the Oncology Hub at cmeoutfitters.com, where you can find a number of excellent resources for both clinicians and patients. So again, Ignis, thank you for joining us for this fabulous and really important discussion. Uh, thank you to you, our audience, for participating and for providing the very best care for patients with endometrial cancer. Thank you. Thank you.